Why has Triple H been so successful? Why is Triple H running WWE better than Vince McMahon and Bruce Prichard on Monday and Friday night? Long-term booking. Thank you so very much for joining us on this special Tuesday afternoon. This is TNT, episode number 42 for your April 2nd, 2024. I am your host, JD, from New York. As always, joined by my co-host, Mr. Andrew Baydala, on this fine Tuesday afternoon. How are you doing, my friend? I am good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I just want to... Can I put to bed? I want to put the rumors to bed and everything else. Last week, I called The Rock DJ. A lot of you called me out in the comments and said, this guy calls DJ like we're buddies. So I do have a confession. I've met The Rock before. We were at a Waffle House. It was packed. I was sitting there by myself, had a cup of coffee. I was finishing up my Grand Slam. And The Rock walked in and said, do you mind if I sit here at a place? I said, sure. He had pancakes. I finished my Grand Slam. And we were best buddies ever since. So thanks, DJ. And what is that you're drinking over there? You uh, you shilling something over there? Oh, it's a Zoa. Ah, oh, so fucking, fucking guy, man. He's shilling Zoa. Oh, man, so for everybody that said Drew doesn't know DJ, there you go, man. A little backstory for you uh, for the old yeah, and if you, con- condescending yeah. prick comments. Yeah, he had pancakes <laughs> at Waffle House, and I had a Grand Slam. Oh, man. Uh, Seth Rollins uh, called him DJ. I, he did. He did. I guess uh, that puts uh, Seth Rollins in the condescending prick category as well, huh? Anyway, uh, we will talk about Monday Night Raw. We will talk about DJ. We will talk about what everybody is here for. And I'm sure Drew and I have uh, a lot to say because I watched with eagle eyes and open ears typing away on my little keyboard here, man. We got the whole transcription for you. The biggest and best parts of the CM Punk Ariel Hawani podcast last night or yesterday afternoon, rather. And my God, man, did it. Burn down the internet wrestling community and add to the tribalism even more so, man. We have people out here defending AEW and Tony Khan as if they are about to go to war legitimately, man, and lose their life for a wrestling company. Seems like it. And for all, <laughs> for all you uh, Fugazis in the chat, they don't serve pancakes or Grand Slams at Waffle House. My goodness, that was the joke. Anyways, um, yeah, I mean, they might as well, AEW might as well shut down after what happened yesterday, right? I mean, that's what everybody and their mother is talking about. So, I mean, why don't we pump the brakes on that? But we're going to get into all that, man. And Raw last night, uh, again, the way it went off the air, I know you talked about it uh, last night in your review show. I actually went to bed. I wanted to watch your show, but I have a long day ahead of me. Um, and it, it, going off the air, the way they have the past two weeks has been excellent, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, I thought the uh, ending to Raw... Last night was very well done. Was not as good of an ending or a show as it was last week, but I thought they forwarded the top programs on the show very nicely going into WrestleMania, and we'll get into that stuff. We'll also talk about the AEW releases. Uh, This seems to have triggered people as well, and people coming out of the woodwork about why the likes of Gravity and Anthony Henry got released from AEW. We will go over that and all the names that are on that list, and... You know, I made a uh, little snide remark on social media. It was quite coincidental that CM Punk basically called AEW an indie promotion with an indie mindset that's not really here to make money, and it's not run like a business. And then we get, in the wee hours of Raw, the AEW uh, company itself releasing talent. It's like Tony Khan was uh, listening. It's like, oh, you know what, Phil's right. I think we'll go ahead and do what uh, Phil uh, says we should do, and that's run like a business. Well, there's no such thing as coincidence. Anybody who tells you that is completely full of shit. So I will say that while I don't think it was coincidence, I do believe that these cuts were probably planned. Yes. And I also do truly believe, and I mean this, I believe that Tony Khan truly thought the world and still probably does of CM Punk and really, really took to his advice when he was a part of AEW and how Tony wanted to do some things and how Phil CM Punk wanted to do things. And I think that Tony really um, enjoyed 
those two when they were working together. And I think that he listened to Punk, which is something a lot of people don't do. But Punk is a very intelligent mind in the wrestling business and in business in general. Well, I mean, if you are in Tony Khan's shoes, why wouldn't you listen to CM Punk? Well, you should. But again, they, uh, he, it's tough for me to say this because there's a lot of my my friends who are in the wrestling business, but it's a very carny esque business where people use people day yeah. in and day out. And it's all about that check, brother, brother, brother. Yeah. But at the end of the day, CM Punk, in my opinion, and the brief interactions I've had with him is a real human being, whether you like him or not. And I'm saying, well, of course he's real, Drew. No, no, no. He's like real. What you see is what you get. And he will give you respect until you don't give him the respect back and then it's off. He, he, you're, you're never coming back with him. And I believe that CM Punk will help anybody. Literally, it doesn't matter if you're jerking the curtain on an indie show or you're main eventing WrestleMania. If you ask him, he will 100% lend his expertise and knowledge. And I think Tony sat under the CM Punk learning tree until that relationship went sour. Uh, I totally agree with you. And uh, I guess we will uh, get into that at the top here. First, I want to thank you guys very much. Follow Drew and I on social, at JD from NY206, at Andrew Baydala on X. Uh, it's going to be a busy week. Drew's flying out tonight, later tonight. I'll be there Thursday. We'll be in Philly. We'll be doing a lot of things. And uh, it's going to be a great time. Tailgate is doing great. Saturday and Sunday, Drew and I will be there starting at 1 p.m., correct? Correct. 1 p.m. start. Uh, and then TNT goes live on Sunday at what time? Do we have a time for that? Uh, we'll, we'll let people file in and then we'll we'll start it. Um, I don't have an exact time yet, but I could tell you that, you know, tailgate, obviously Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is uh, Rhino, Al Snow, Cal Hero, and AJ Francis top dollar. And um, Sunday is myself and JD might be some other people stopping by to say what's up to me or maybe even jd who knows but uh yeah it's gonna be a great time tailgate show the menu is out all you could eat all you could drink there's even a vip option where you'll have access to liquor uh i will be in the vip lounge with jd and some others hanging out and having a couple cordial cocktails before we head into wrestlemania and uh yeah i'm looking forward to it we have damn near 500 people showing up so i i'm truly humbled Hopefully, uh, weather permits. I mean, up here on the East Coast, the weather is terrible. So uh, we oh, will uh, hope for uh, me looking. sunny days going into Philadelphia. Whoa! Sunny days. <laughs> oh. sun, sh sunshine for Philadelphia, hopefully. Uh, so I'm excited to meet you guys. And yes, there will be a meet and greet. There will be. You guys can come up to us. Pictures, autographs, whatever the fuck you want. Uh, we'll be there to chit chat and uh, yeah, that's out. included, guys. Yeah. That's in and girls, that's included in your purchase. Not like prices. anybody wants our autograph, but I mean, no. But I'm just saying, you want a picture uh, Saturday, or you want a picture with us on Sunday, and you want a picture with the talent on Saturday, who's going to be there. It's all included. We're not charging. They're not asking you for twenty bucks. They're not nothing. I have taken care of that myself. Tailgate Joe, um, JD, we've we've taken care of all of that. All expenses have been paid. The talent is going to be paid. By us, and they will 100% take any pictures, sign any autographs you may need. So, no extra fees. Should be a good time, guys. And then uh, Drew and I will be hitting up WWE World. We'll be at WrestleCon. We'll be uh, doing the Undertaker Deadman show on Thursday night. So, if you guys are in and around those events, please do not hesitate to say what's up. So, uh, we look forward to seeing some of you out there. Uh, also, go check out the Monday Night Raw post show from last night. Really great discussion there. We had upwards towards 3,500 people live last night. Thank you guys for that. And please hit that thumbs up. Strive for a thousand likes on this Tuesday afternoon. And make sure you guys hit that subscribe button down below and please turn on the bell for notifications. As for Thursday, uh, depending on how we feel, uh, I'll be with Drew at the BNB. &B. We may get some predictions up of, uh, of some kind. We'll see what happens. We'll see how we're feeling. But right now is TNT 42. We wanted to bring it to you guys and we'll start off with the CM Punk. Ariel Hawani post show or uh, podcast on the MMA hour. The one thing, Drew, that I noticed about the Ariel Hawani podcast, and I know Ariel Hawani's uh, come under some scrutiny from Tony Khan himself about being uh, a traitor or a con man or uh, an insider for WWE or whatever. He's represented by Nick Khan. What, I mean, whatever, you know. whatever have you. Tony Khan likes to throw the jabs out there. But at the end of the day, I watched this in its entirety. I did not watch the Ray Ripley segment. I did see the clips online. I didn't really care. It was uh, CM Punk for me only, but the way he handled this this interview with with Punk, 
you know, the questioning that he asked Punk, not afraid to go and kind of overstep his boundaries a little bit to maybe try and get those answers, and Punk was receptive to it. He may this morning regret some of the things that he said. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm not Phil Brooks. But I think the way Punk came off, the way Punk answered, and the way Ariel Hawani pushed him, but not too much to get those questions out there and maybe get those answers. I thought it was a fantastic interview. It was. And I don't think, you know, Phil has any, CM Punk has any regrets this morning. You know, people think I'm a giant asshole. So I totally understand how people have that perception of Phil. Phil is a very what you see is what you get type of person. And he pulls no punches. I've always told my wife, I've always told other people who are my friends or who are meeting me for the first time, don't ask me a question you don't. Obviously, you know, with my wife, maybe I mind my P's and Q's. Yeah. But I will say, don't ask me a question you don't want me to be honest with you because there's no there's no point. Other, don't ask it. And I think that's very much how Phil is, CM Punk is. You know, Ariel Hawani and Chris Van Vliet, in my opinion, Chris happens to be a, a good friend of mine. I, I met Ariel a couple times, They and this is not a, a homer thing for me because of Chris. Chris is one of the best, if not the best interviewers in the game, and Ariel Hawani is right there with him. Yes, I agree. I agree. It's I agree. One a, yeah, it's 1A and 1B. They are the, the two top dogs right now, in my opinion, in the game. Um, and Ariel Hawani got everything he could have wanted out of CM Punk, and if CM Punk didn't want to answer, he wouldn't have. And I respect Phil for CM Punk for going on the internet, going on the MMA hour, and just being brutally honest. And I love that about him. Yeah, I thought it was uh, incredible last night. And same thing with uh, with Chris. He does an excellent job as well. Never afraid to ask those questions. Never afraid to go out and get that interview that a lot of people may look down on him for. He did that with Velveteen Dream. He went out and was the first one to do that. Gave us the answers put that show out there for everybody to listen to. And he's not afraid to do that, even though some blowback might have come his way for that. He's not afraid. And I really respect that uh, as mm -hmm. far as his uh, content creator vision is concerned. Uh, with CM Punk... Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, with, with Ariel Hawani and people being like, oh, he's a, he's a WWE shill and stuff like that, you got to remember, Ariel was represented and still is represented by Nick Khan, or maybe he isn't anymore. So Nick Khan and Ariel Hawani are friends, okay? Number one. Number two, they were business associates and still are. And we should be thankful, okay, you, you the people who are in this, this scope, this realm, the, the media journalists, uh, reporters, if you want to call them that, realm, should be thankful that Ariel has the connections and the ins because of Nick Khan, two guys like CM Punk and Rhea Ripley and, and, and different type of superstars that could pop on his show because you're not getting that anywhere else. The only person that would get it is Pat and Pat works with WWE directly. So, I mean, is anybody else interviewing CM Punk right now? No. Is, no, is, is anybody going to ask CM Punk the questions that were asked yesterday? No, no. And is CM Punk going to be on any of these WWE post shows? Fuck no, no, <laughs> no, he's, he's not. Ne he's never and, doing a scrum again, man. Well, and how many times did I tell you that? I said this, you will, ne you won't see Punk at any of these post shows for WWE. I mean, maybe he does like a kickoff show where he could welcome the crowd and all that other stuff. I think he's going to do that in Philadelphia on Friday, but Punk's not going to ask answer questions. I've said that to you at nauseum. Those media things are the biggest like moron fest with an exception to few that I have ever seen. It's like they ask questions about a storyline driven character instead of getting to the meat and bones of why you're there. You're there to get answers to questions you need answers to. You're uh in 3 months, do you see yourself defending the championship against uh, Stone Cold, The Rock, or Triple H? Well, like, what? Ask better questions. That's all I'm saying. So who do you want right. to do, do defend that title against next? Like, it's like it's their fucking choice. Right. Like, Tony and that's Khan's going to give me the like, fucking the, the next title defense. Who gives a shit? I like that Tony makes his, you know, stars readily available. The same thing with WWE. But WWE's is very much a controlled atmosphere. Where AEW is and isn't at times. But for me, it's like... If you're going to get there and you get the opportunity, you're privileged, privileged and blessed to get to that opportunity where you're at these post show scrums, all this other stuff, media, press conferences, ask good questions. You know, I, I'll, I'll shout out Issa. She asked a question about PLEs and all this other stuff. Like, that's good shit. That's a good question. To sit back and be like, you know, would you rather face The Rock or Roman? Oh, I feel like Jim Ross on Livewire. Oh, God bless his soul, you know?
Would you love to see Taylor Swift compete in WWE? Mm. Sure thing, guy. Right. Fucking ridiculous. I mean, come on. They ask a real question. But Punk, Punk did call out the media scrums and did call them cringe last night on the uh, Ariel Hawani show. And we'll start with some of the uh, least incriminating things, and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of what he said. He did talk about the Vince McMahon allegations. And meeting Vince after 10 years, after leaving AEW and getting back to the WWE, he was uh, at Titan Tower, and he did see Vince at the Titan Tower gym. So he did say that there was no positivity there. I didn't read all the allegations. I did read the text messages and went, oh, fuck this. It's indefensible. I'm kind of shocked at how dumb he was writing stuff down and leaving that paper trail. It's all horrific. Punk expressed support for the alleged victims and agreed that professional wrestling business is better off without Vince McMahon. So um, he did shy away from mentioning Vince on camera on on Raw last week in that segment with Drew McIntyre. Obviously not afraid to mention Vince here in the context that Ari Hawani did ask that question. And he did say what a lot of people uh, are uh, probably thinking in WWE and cannot say, that the company is better off without Vince McMahon there. Uh, there are victims here, so what CM Punk thinks about Vince McMahon, CM Punk relationship, doesn't mean fucking anything here. Uh, all that stuff takes a back seat. I'm more concerned about going forward, how these people survive, going through this trauma. He ruined his life, ruining other people's lives. So there's very much a part of me that's like, we got him, good. Shuffle him into the basement. And then, Drew, he did mention this, which took a lot of people by surprise because we didn't really expect a Chris Benoit reference. The biggest thing I can draw... A comparison to is when Chris Benoit did a murder-suicide, Punk said, I was friends with Chris, and I'm famously on camera weeping because at the time we didn't know the week prior I'm traveling with him, and he grabs me and runs me into the trainer's room, and his little son is in the training room taping up his hands and putting X's on his hands. Obviously, I don't have memories of Benoit traveling with me and murdering people in a gym. I've never been in a room with Vince where he's sexually assaulting somebody, but there's part of me where... Oh, no, 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 no. Well, that's not all he said. He said shitting on people, too. Well, I mean, I left he that said, out. We don't want to talk. That's about all right. That's all yeah. right. I mean, it's what he said. He did. I mean, I mean listen, and, Punk, like you said, Punk is open. He's, he's not going to bullshit with nobody. Don't ask questions if you don't want the answers to him. There's part of me where, just like with Benoit, I was like, oh, yeah, I can see it. So that's basically the gist of what he said there. But he did compare it to the Chris Benoit situation. Basically, in a way, you know, he's not comparing the severity of the situations but one is a murder, the other one's a rape. But the other, but the, the whole basis of the situation is you look at that individual and say, oh, yeah, after the fact, I, I could see that being the case with Vince McMahon. And the gist of it is he's not there anymore, and we got him. Good. CM Punk saying the, the loud part out loud that people can't really express. So uh, that's basically what he said there. And then we get into the CM Punk and Jack Perry all-in situation. Was I was surprised— and I will, I will ask this, Drew, before I read the, the, the transcript here by Ariel Hawani. Are you surprised that Punk actually went into some detail here? Because we did get a lot of NDA talk about this. Why did Punk seemingly open the door to talk about this last night when we were told something else? And being that you said Ariel Hawani is a Nick Khan guy, did mm -hmm. Punk get the okay to talk about this willingly, openly like this with Ariel Hawani? Did he get okay by WWE? Uh, I would assume so. And again, again, you know what assuming does, but I will say that I don't think WWE, you know, I, I think Punk probably talked to Nick and or Triple H, Paul Levesque and said, hey, am I free to be myself on here? And they probably both were like, hell yeah, that's what we, that's what I want. That's what we want you on there. You know, like obviously he, they were probably like, don't go into too much detail on stuff that maybe you don't know about. And CM Punk didn't. You know, he was close with Benoit. A lot of people were taken aback by that. I know I was. I, you know, I didn't know Chris like that and uh, had never really had any interactions like those guys did. And people that I know who knew Chris and all that other stuff, like they were all you know, flabbergasted when that news came out. They just never saw it. And then things settled and they saw it. The same thing with Vince. You know, CM Punk knew Vince, worked directly with Vince. Um, I'm pretty sure that maybe Nick Khan and Triple H were kind of like, hey, if he brings up Vince, you know, just say what you got to say and get out of there, but don't don't get too descriptive. So I, I do believe that Punk was probably in conversation or had had conversations with both Nick Khan and Paul Levesque, Triple H. Yeah, yeah uh, I think that's probably the likely scenario as well. CM Punk did say in regards to Vince McMahon that Vince always wanted this fatherly uh, relationship with his uh, his male performers, and CM Punk was like, no, I already have a father. You know, you're my boss. Let's keep it at that. So I did uh, yeah. 
I did like that comment by Punk. He didn't want anything to do with Vince McMahon and that type of relationship. So uh, we did get that out of him. And then we get into the AEW stuff. And I have said for months, even before Punk landed back in WWE, I said, and a lot of people were like, oh, Punk's not going to end up back in WWE. He'll never make the jump over there. They don't want him. I'm like, can you fucking break? They don't want CM Punk. Triple right. H, I said this time and time and time again. He would be drooling at the fact that if CM Punk had a live microphone and was able to get some jabs in on Tony Khan and AEW, because let's be real, folks, Triple H feels that Tony Khan killed NXT and put a, uh, a fucking knife in what he was doing. And he blames Tony Khan for a lot of shit, even though we all blame Vince McMahon for it. Triple H is blaming Tony Khan for things that have happened in that specific time period. Let's be real. So when Triple H saw the opportunity to get CM Punk back in WWE to give this man a live microphone and cut down Tony Khan and AEW at any chance he gets. Triple H was foaming at the mouth to have that happen. This apparently yeah. was the stage for that to happen. And Triple H, I, like Drew said, did he go get some clearance from Triple H? Triple H said, fuck you, you go do what you got to do. Just keep it within the boundaries. Say what you got to say. Right, and I think the moment I texted about five or six people, the moment I saw Tony Khan, and I think it was Labor Day weekend, the moment I saw Tony Khan, appear on my television screen. I think we were having a barbecue or something. I had the outside TV on and I watched, it was collision. I believe that he had fired CM Punk from all elite wrestling because it was conduct detrimental and he feared for his safety. I texted five or six of my closest friends. I even think I texted you truthfully. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. And I said, CM Punk is 1000% going back to WWE after that promo. I said, if it's not a work, which I don't believe it is, and I hate using like insider terms, but a work is, you know, fake, it's storyline, um, he'll be 100% be back in WWE, and he was. And your question about Jack Perry, am I surprised that Punk went into detail? No, because AEW, in my opinion, was so concerned about getting rid of CM Punk at that point that they just were like, here's, you know, let's agree on a, a, a settlement, and you go your way and I'll go mine. And I, I think that, you know, um, Punk waited, you know, it's been six months, right? Seven months, eight months since yeah. the incident. So he waited a long time to talk about it. Do we ever hear a rebuttal from Jack Perry? Jack Perry would be an absolute moron to even try and touch this, <laughs> truthfully. <laughs> let, let CM Punk and the narrative, you know, sit however it needs to be. Because what Punk also did is he put a lot of heat on a lot of uh anger and a lot of nastiness on jack perry and i think jack perry can use that to his advantage this you know the other thing here which i had called for tony khan to be the devil for months and months and months at world's end with max i love that tony didn't respond i really did he had did not go on twitter x and respond to this and i know that people like tony can't work tony can't do this i, I don't need tony in the ring but tony could use this too and become this evil, maniacal, stupid, nasty son of a bitch on TV if he wanted to. But if it's me, I let everyone have their perception of me and go about my business. All right, we'll pick it up at that Chicago Raw where Punk surprised everybody by showing up backstage while he was under AEW contract. A lot of people were like, oh, he just showed up. He was looking for a job. He wanted to speak to Triple H about getting back in WWE while being under AEW contract, which was a load of bullshit, which was being thrown out there by uh, people on social media. Bailey, Bailey, the one who's challenging EO Sky at WrestleMania for the Women's Championship, invited Punk to visit Raw when it was in Chicago in April of last year while he was rehabilitating his triceps. And he confirmed that he was asked to leave and says he was, you know, he would figured he would be asked to leave. X what the reaction at AEW was by Ariel Hawani. Punk said he believed the word betrayed was used, but didn't say by whom. So, uh, you know, obviously they're going to think one way. Punk's going to feel another way. But, you know, if Bailey, who he's friends with, invites him to Raw to visit friends backstage while under AEW contract, do you find that to be that big of a deal and something that you would throw the word betrayed around when Punk obviously still has friends there? Or what was, or maybe Punk had different motives and AEW was right, feeling that he did betray the company and wanted out? You know, 
I think people need to grow up, especially if people were throwing that at CM Punk, Phil Brooks, that were working in AEW betrayed. Like, that's such childhood, like, childish bullshit. Like, come on. You know, um, on Saturday and throughout this week, I'll be seeing people, and if somebody asks me to, you know, do something, you think that JD is going to be like, you betrayed me. Like, no. we're it's TNT only. No, because we're not fucking four years old. You know, like, we're not, I, I'm not your only friend. You're you know what the, you know you know you know, you know what Drew does you know he's gonna get back to it all yeah, obviously after WrestleMania it's just a hectic week Drew's been going live Friday night and out you know he he's he's got respect for the people that he cares about and and he goes live on a different platform audio only and he talks about SmackDown while the show is live the last hour of SmackDown and it bleeds into my show he says you're gonna have a, a problem with if I if I go live uh, while you're live I'm like no dude do do what you want to do as long well, as you you asked me respectfully it's yeah. not taking anything away from me you go do your thing yeah great and I jump yeah I jump off there 15 minutes but you know into your show because at that point we've been on for an hour and realistically everyone can eat it's all about yeah. you know having everybody at the table so. I've never been the type of person who like, oh, that person's my only friend and not yours. That that doesn't work. So for the betrayed stuff, it's so childish. It's ridiculous. Punk wanted to visit friends. Were there extra motives? Only he will know that, but I don't believe that. Um, and again, you know, like I'm I'm almost 40. Um, I I like who has time for this shit? No, Truthfully, I, like it's ridiculous. Do 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 I think personally, if I was uh if I was a betting man, would I say CM Punk wanted out at that point from AEW? I would say yes. I, I would say that he was probably near the end of his rope there. Uh, why he was brought back to Collision and why Collision was built around him, I don't think he wanted that. I really didn't. He embraced it because, you know, obviously you put someone in that position of power and, and you're the boss, per se, and you're Tony Khan's advisor. You know, he mm -hmm. said he was. Obviously, that's going to be a position where... You feel like you can maybe throw your weight around, make things in that place a little bit better. But even that was a fucking problem, which we'll get into because he did discuss that as well. Yeah. Um, we can get into the collision stuff later when you want to talk about it. But um, I, you know, after Brawl Out, which Punk can't talk about, yeah, which was very interesting, he didn't have an NDA about anything he did, he said, but he had, you know, the, the Bucks and it seems like Omega and Hangman do. Um, it seems as if he was done with AEW yeah. and he was just tired of the bullshit. And it's unfortunate because you could see when now you go back and look at that interview. I, you know, I read body language pretty damn well. And you could tell that Punk was dejected, but I did not know that that was like the straw that broke the camel's back on the terms in the terms of that CM Punk Phil Brooks wanted to be done with AEW. If you go back and watch all in though, I said to Blake Mitchmore, who watches the show and is one of my best friends, I said to Blake, man, this looks strange from Punk. And he was like, what do you mean? And I had a bunch of people in the backyard, and I said, it's almost like he's saying goodbye. Yeah, I think you said that to me, too, as well. I was in the arena. Yeah. I didn't see that vantage point. You were watching it on TV, so you had a better, yeah. look, at that, a better look at it than I did. I said to my buddy, I said, I think that might be the last time you ever see CM Punk in an AEW ring. I was like, but, and I don't know why. Wasn't you know nobody from AEW text me and be like, hey, you'll never believe what happens. That's not that's just not the game. Yeah. It never has been, never will be. Those guys really respect their their company and they respect Tony, and they do not ever hit me with spoilers or anything else like that. And realistically, I don't even know if those guys are privy to that information. But I will say that when I watched it, I was like, something, something's off. And I did text you. I was like, hey, punk is I think punk's done. And you know, lo and behold, we knew what happened backstage now, but it, you know, it's very interesting. So the discussion of the all-out incident last August began with AEW not providing transportation, which was very well documented. Even when I was in London, I heard about this, which I didn't believe it at first because I didn't believe how AEW could be that fucking lax with their biggest star. Not providing transportation for Punk when he arrived in London for the show at Wembley. He says it wasn't a big deal, but it was completely irresponsible as a company to leave someone stranded at the airport. So he took the tube and he got his way to, you know, the stadium, and he found his own way to where All In was taking place at Wembley. Uh, I find that to be ridiculous. I, I don't know why there was a lack of communication there. Um, Tony Khan fumbled that one. I, I don't know. If Tony Khan has CM Punk at this show and he's your biggest star, that should be your biggest priority. I don't know why this man was not given transportation or somebody wasn't waiting for him at the airport. I don't understand that. 
Um, I think that... Unless it was an inside job by the Bucks fucking with him. Right. I think that maybe Tony doesn't handle that type of stuff because realistically, you know, I, I'm not saying it's beneath Tony Khan, but I think he has bigger things to worry about than whether or not, you know, all the transportation set. I think there's people probably in place that do that for them. And if there's not, they should 100% get one. It's really not that difficult. Um, well, then whoever but, that person is or was, they're not there anymore because that's fucking ridiculous. Well, that's part of it. Also, could it have been an inside job? Sure. Is it ridiculous? Yes. But there's two sides to every story. CM Punk could have been, you know, could have texted Tony and been like, hey, Tony, there's no car here. I guess I'm going to hop on the tube, but I would have really appreciate if you could send a car. And I guarantee you that would have been rectified. Yeah. But CM Punk seems to be of a mindset that I am too. Okay. You know what? You're not here. I'll get my own way there, and I'm not going to say nothing. I don't give a shit, but I'll put it in the memory bank, and I won't forget it. And that is what has happened. It's basically you look at a situation like that, not even if you're CM Punk, if you're uh, starting your day out and things are going that badly so early in the day to start your day, it's like, man, what else is going to happen today? It, it almost set off a trigger of dynamite, no pun intended, uh, for what led up to what happened that night. So uh, that's something he did talk about. They backtracked to talk about the incident with Jack Perry backstage at Collision that led to Perry's pre-show Cry Me a River message to Punk at All In. Punk says it was Tony Khan's idea to run Dynamite and Collision as separate shows as part of his return to the company after Brawl Out. He didn't think it would work and asked for his release. Now, I'm going to stop there before we get on to the next piece of business. A lot of people were taking this out of context this doesn't mean Punk is saying the separate rosters won't work. He's saying the separate rosters won't work to keep the harmony because people in that company did not want him there. That was what he was alluding to. Not because Drew and I have said split the rosters is going to make for a better show. He wasn't talking about anything in regards to that. He said, you putting me on this show by myself away from those guys is not going to solve the problem. That's basically what he's saying here. Yeah, he's 100%. I mean, we... I like yelled at the top of my lungs on this show that the elite and CM Punk and FTR needed to do business, especially CM Punk and the elite. They needed to have that six man tag. They even needed to have singles. They could have had that business stretch over a 12 to 18 month span. And the business would have been great. They would have cashed checks and they would have printed money. Problem was that it seemed like some people didn't want to do business. The elite that falls on Tony Khan and the elite. You should have made them do business. In my opinion, and act like adults. I will stand by that. I'm sorry if that's you know something that bothers people. So be it. But realistically, this is the wrestling business. It's not the wrestling playground, and it's not the wrestling friends. It's the wrestling business, and they needed to do business. They didn't like that maybe CM Punk was to tight with Tony. Tough shit. They didn't like the fact that maybe CM Punk got to call some shots. Tough shit. Okay, y'all are EVPs. All right. So knock it the hell off. We all understood that you started the company, but yeah, the split that he's talking about is you have five of your biggest stars not being able to be on the same show. That's ridiculous. And it's childish. It would never work because realistically punk not appearing on dynamite was a giant mistake and punk only appearing on collision was smart for a brief period because he was only there for like a month and a half and then he was terminated. So it, it's just dumb. If you can't have Hangman Page and Kenny Omega appear on Collision because CM Punk's there, what a waste. What an absolute waste. Get your shit together, act like adults, and do business. It actually, it actually pisses me off now that we're kind of revisiting this. It's like, you know, Punk is only on Collision and he needs to remain on Collision. I feel like it was done purposely and the Young Bucks went, went along with that and said, you know what, that's best for what... AEW needs. Meanwhile, Collision, you know, starting out that first month, they started out near 900,000 for that debut mm -hmm. episode. Then obviously they dropped. And then they normalized around 500, 550, 600,000 viewers for a CM Punk led Collision on a Saturday night. Saturday night, nobody's watching pro wrestling this summer on a Saturday night. So realistically, they were okay. This is the mindset. This is perception is everything, folks. The Young Bucks, 
who love AEW, created AEW as an alternative, want their biggest star to not be seen and rather him be seen on Saturday night in front of half the audience that they usually get on a Wednesday night on Dynamite. To me, that is absolutely fucking ludicrous. And how Tony Khan allowed that, I don't fucking know. Yeah, we signed this guy to $5 million a year and we're not going to put him on the A show? Yeah, it's dumb. It's dumb. The fact that they wouldn't do business together and that they they separated you know, this group from that group just because they wanted to keep harmony. It did the exact opposite. Not only did it do the exact opposite, it was terrible for business. CM Punk still being in AEW right now would have been best for business for AEW, even if Punk didn't want to be there. After Brawl Out in Chicago, it seemed like CM Punk was done. But you want to know what? Again, everything starts at the top. And Tony should have made these guys sit down, even if it was against everything that they wanted to do. I don't care. I, I you Listen, I appreciate everything you guys have done for us and what you continue to do for us. But this is business, and I need you guys to knock off the bullshit. I need you to put your egos aside, and let's make money because that's what this is about. And can you imagine the money we can make if you guys bury this shit and we get this match and then a singles and then a six, come on. It's going to be big business. And whether you like the guy or not, it's the wrestling business. Let's just do business. Let's do what's best for AEW because nobody's above the three letters. We were proven wrong on that one. Ridiculous. It's just thinking about it, looking back. FTR, Young Bucks haven't had a real fucking story since they began feuding in AEW. Oh, two of the best tag team, be a fucking break. I need a goddamn story. You got the story right there. Would have been the best story that they had together, all four of them. Punk and Omega selling out all, St well, not all state arena, fucking uh, where, wherever uh, first dance was, the United Center. 17, 18,000 seats, goodbye. Tony Khan would have racked up a fucking payday for Omega and Punk in the main event for a fucking pay per view there. Look, look what they missed you, out on. Could you imagine Omega and Punk headlining Wembley or a stadium show in Sold Jacksonville out. or where? Oh, forget about it. Sold out. Ridiculous. And like Drew said, it all starts at the top. The fact that Tony Khan, a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, this and that about Punk, you're not a fan of Punk. Well, I mean, clearly Punk is to blame, but he's not the only one to blame here. Tony Khan was not a leader. Tony Khan was not a boss. At the end of the day, you are paying them. You are signing the paychecks. You tell them what to do. Get everybody in a fucking room and get them to make money. But again, everybody calls Tony Khan a money mark, and that's exactly what he's portrayed as, and that's exactly how he came off. A friend, like Drew said, we don't want friends. We want a business. We want the best matches possible, but we want everything to be the right way. We want things to make sense, and you missed out. And that's why people right now aren't taking to the Young Bucks. They'll never take to the Young Bucks, and they forever hate the Young Bucks because they blame the Young Bucks for driving CM Punk out of the company and not wanting to do business because they're jealous pricks. It's exactly what it's going to be. Unfortunately, it seems that way. So he did go on to talk about the glass, the real glass situation. To the initial run-in with Perry, the former Jungle Boy, wanted to smash a rental car with a pipe, and Punk told him no after several others had told him no already. He mentioned Tony Schiavone, he mentioned Mike Manzari, he mentioned a bunch of other people, other uh, agents backstage. Damaging the rental car would set a bad precedent, says Punk. And the doctor also had safety concerns. He told Perry he would have to wait to do that on Dynamite and thought Perry was fine, but shit never got squashed. So I don't know why this had to, again, I don't really understand this. Why did, why did this have to fall on the lap of CM Punk to go talk to Jack Perry, which only exacerbated the problem? Where's Tony Khan in this? I don't really understand. Why, why, why is everybody else telling Jungle Boy not to do this where he's going to have even more ammunition to say no because they aren't his bosses. Tony Khan's the fucking. Then you're going to send CM Punk out there, who everybody already dislikes at this point, to tell Jack Perry, don't use real glass. The fuck do you think is going to happen? Tony Khan tells this kid not to use glass, and that's the end of the fucking story, and we don't have a fucking problem here. Simple. Yeah. But again, everything starts at the top, so if they felt they didn't have that support or they weren't going to get it, then that's how they had to handle things. And again, um, I wish things were done differently, but you know, Jack Perry seemed to act like a, a child and now, you know, 
we thank AEW for getting CM Punk back into the wrestling business, but realistically, like the elite, as much as everyone wants to put them on this pedestal, in my opinion, you know, Jack Perry being buddies with this other person, the hangman page stuff and the young bucks just doesn't seem like they were, they're doing what's good for business. No. And a lot of people are making correlations to Darby Allen. Did CM Punk talk to Darby Allen about you not using glass and taking risks? <laughs> I mean, who knows what CM Punk told Darby Allen? He's Darby not Allen, there anymore. Uh, Dar- I mean, he's not there anymore, but Darby Allen's been open about, you know, wanting to do what he wants to do. People have talked to him about it, and he said, I don't give a shit. I'm going to do, do what I want to do. All right, fine. Okay, you go make your mistakes. You live uh, and die by your own sword. It's basically what it is. But it, it all lays on the lap of CM Punk when it should be You can in, only in Tony tell Kong's somebody. Lap. I know. You know, you can only tell somebody so many times, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Stay away from this. And if they don't want to do it, then it's on them. It's on them, man. Regarding the all-out incident, Punk feels Perry was influenced by the people he's friends with. No shit. He says he asked Khan to handle the situation because he said if he had to, Khan wouldn't like how he did it. Khan didn't handle it. Again, it all goes back to why Tony Khan isn't being a boss. When Perry came back after his match, Punk had people with him but wouldn't say who they were. As to not get them in trouble. He went up to him and asked why he insists on doing this dumb internet shit. Perry told him if he didn't like it, he should do something about it. So that's obviously uh, a very aggressive answer to uh, egg on CM Punk to do something about it. Punk says he didn't punch anybody. He just choked somebody out a little bit, is what he said. So... He looks over at Tony Khan. This is what I don't understand. I, I don't know what Tony Khan is doing. I really don't. He's sitting right there. Uh, Punk also said that he did not threaten Tony Khan. You know, take it with a grain of salt. We heard that Tony Khan was threatened. He went on national television and said his life was threatened. He never felt more threatened in a wrestling show than what he felt at all in. Whatever the case may be. Again, it's Punk's story against everybody else's story. So there's two sides to every story. But why didn't Tony Khan handle it when Punk literally looked at him before he went through the curtain to go wrestle Samoa Joe? You deal with this, otherwise I will, and you're not going to like what's going to happen. Tony, where are you? Why? You should have pulled Jack Perry to the side and said, Jack, cut the shit. This is the company's biggest show on its biggest night, and you're making a fucking fool of yourself. He should have been reprimanded right then and there by the boss, not CM Punk. And none of this would have happened. And you know what? Punk might have been still in AEW. But here we are. Well, and it's not a might have. I do believe Punk still would have been in AEW because Tony wasn't going to let him go. CM Punk said that. Samoa Joe told him to stop. So he did. Then he turned to Khan and told him, this place is a fucking joke, man. You're a clown. I quit. Joe and Jerry Lynn came to his room and got him to do the pay-per-view opening match. He said he was too fired up. Then and now rehashing it, and we'll probably regret talking about it, but that's what happened. So he went back to his locker room. They got him. He went out there, and he said, I basically went out there because I had to. I didn't want to let the fans down. I didn't want to let Samoa Joe down. So CM Punk did what was best for business, even in that heat of the moment where he did not even want to be there, and he quit the company. He says he wrestled the match for Joe, referee Paul Turner, Jerry Lynn, who was the agent of the match, and the fans. But he knew it was his last time wrestling Joe and in the company, which is something that you alluded to uh, several moments ago, Drew. You felt like it was Punk's last match, and that's exactly what he said he knew going out there. It's the last time I'm going to be here. He hasn't spoken to Tony Khan since backstage at Wembley when he quit. He didn't do anything to make him fear for his life. As Khan said, when announcing Punk's firing on Dynamite, Punk said he quit. Tony Khan fired him. But Punk said he is who he is. He believes there was a concerted effort to try and slander him and try to ruin his character. Do you believe that's the case, Drew? Do you believe Tony Khan tried to slander and ruin CM Punk's character after Tony Khan realistically should be thanked for bringing CM Punk out of retirement? And we've said this several times on the show. Without Tony Khan, CM Punk is not back in the Mm -hmm. WWE. I haven't heard anything from Tony Khan's camp or himself about slandering CM Punk. I mean, Tony said he can't talk about it, doesn't want to talk about it. So I don't believe, was there other people that are affiliated with AEW who are currently under contract that uh, probably tried to slander CM Punk in his name? Absolutely. But Tony Khan, no, I, I haven't seen Tony say anything and I doubt you do. I think Tony, 
like I said, was a fan of CM Punk, was excited to work with CM Punk, was sitting under the learning tree, and uh, I bet you he wishes this never happened, and I bet you if he had to do it all over again, he would have done it differently, and that's what happens in life. You make mistakes and you grow. So this this is basically CM Punk having an internal feeling. It's not something that was reported or stated as factual. This is Punk believing that there was an effort. He believes they tried to ruin his character, but there's no real evidence of that uh, anywhere uh, from Tony Khan, or Tony Khan did not say that. I don't even think Tony Khan would actually go out there and do that, to be quite honest with you. I mean, this guy didn't even want to attempt to, to say anything or reprimand Jack Perry. He's not going to go out there and fucking slander CM Punk's name. Tony so, Khan's not going to come no. out here, and in my this is, again, my opinion. I don't think Tony's going to come out here and be like, eh, you know what, CM Punk's full of shit. I think Tony Khan's going to let whatever was said be said, and maybe he'll say... Maybe one or two things like, well, I don't think that's 100% accurate, but I'm not really going to get into that. And that's a smart move by Tony. Yeah. Spreading rumors and lies and bullshit was the genesis of all his issues at AEW. He thinks it might have been jealousy or envy. It was. He's right on that. But doesn't understand why anyone would try to dim the star of the company's top guy. Well, he answered the question himself. Jealousy and envy. They yeah. didn't want the spotlight to be taken away from them. It's their company. He came in. He knew that everybody was there watching him. He was going to make the appropriate changes to change their vision. They didn't want that, and they basically found a way to get him out. That's exactly the way it ended up. And again, you know, uh, jealousy is a hell of a drug, and so is envy. And I truthfully believe that, again, not there. This is just my opinion and what I saw translate on television. They took... The elite took the side of uh, Scott Colton, Colt Cabana, and it seems like the relationship was going to be completely damaged and broken from the jump. I do believe that the Bucks probably wanted CM Punk to come to AEW. Same thing goes with Omega. Then he came in and saw that the treatment that he was given and everything else like that, and they couldn't stand it. I'm sure that CM Punk, Phil Brooks, and Tony Khan were very tight. Phil had two different contracts. He said it. And I'm sure that they were very jealous. That's my opinion. I don't understand why if you're bringing this man into the company and you know that Scott Colton is still working for the company, why this shit wasn't squashed before he signed on the dotted line. You knew what you were getting yourself into. Like, I don't understand why nothing was done. No precautionary measures were taken to keep these two at a distance or at least have them be in, in a working relationship for the business. I don't really understand why none of this was talked about. That was something that, you know, CM Punk, uh, Phil Brooks, and Scott Colton, Cole Cabana were doing business, and they were just going their separate ways, and that's life. There's a lot of times where you see people you don't like or don't get along anymore with, and you just kind of go one way, and they go the other, and they did their best to avoid each other and not have conflict, and I think that was what's best for business. The elite CM Punk shit, was ridiculous and they should have squashed that and made a lot of money and it's unfortunate that they didn't and i understand tony might have uh one set of loyalty to them because you know it's five stars you know technically versus one and man that one star is pretty goddamn glaring and if it was me i would have done my damnedest to make sure that all six of them could sit at the table and it's unfortunate they're not this was the most glaring line of the entire podcast. He asked to describe working for Tony Khan. Punk replied, he's not a boss. He's a nice guy, though. Ultimately, that's a detriment to the company. But it's not my company. I'm an outsider. I thought I was brought in to sell merchandise and tickets and draw numbers for pay-per-view and stuff. And I clearly did that. But that's not what the place was about. And some people didn't like that. He goes on to say, Drew, that... The company is not there to be a business. They're not about selling tickets. They're not about drawing money. It's not about making money. It's just not. I don't know what it's about. I think maybe having good matches, maybe. And there's nothing wrong with that. And then he goes on to say that AEW is an indie company with an indie mentality. And everybody's okay having five-star matches being rated by some goofball. And if that is what they want, that's what they're going to do and nothing more. And that, to me, was the most glaring thing of the entire show because that's exactly what I have been trying to get through everybody's skull, and nobody seems to listen. Drew has said it multiple times on this platform as well. Before I get into what I feel about that, what was your takeaway from that line? 
Um, again, is he, is he wrong with what? The fact that they're not there to make money. Well, I think anybody who starts a business would be ridiculous to not get into business to make money. But do I think that they cater to a niche audience? Yes, I do. Um, unfortunately, I do. Um, and I do believe that they need to take steps to get out of that. Now, I understand everyone's like, it's all elite wrestling. That's great. I understand that the elite are help, you know, make this company what it is to a certain extent. But was Jericho part of the elite? No. And without Chris Jericho, AEW isn't where they're at right now. Without Brian Danielson, is he part of the elite? No. Without CM Punk, is AEW where AEW is right now? No. Without John Moxley. How did everybody right. feel when Moxley showed up at Double or Nothing and fucking attacked right. Kenny Omega for the first time? Everybody, I mean, I was, I know where I was. I was at the fucking show. I the, was the energy in, at that show was never duplicated, ever. Was that Cody and uh, Dustin? Yes. Yeah. So we were. I was watching that in my backyard again, and when Moxley came through the crowd, I was like, "Holy shit, this is real!" Legit, deal you're, wa you're, you're watching. You're watching a game-changing make ma yeah. a decision happening right before your very eyes, right there. Yeah. And again, so yeah, I get it. It's all elite wrestling, but the elite needs to stand for what takes place in the ring, not a group or a clique of gentlemen. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. That's, be and, yeah, that's beautifully said. And you know what? We need to sit down and fix this shit before it's too late and it realistically will never be too late because tony will tony Khan will continue to put money into this because he is passionate i applaud him for that and he's determined and the media rights deal will change a lot of narratives but and it's a big but they need to get everybody on the same page nobody is above aew tony khan needs to listen and I know at some point he tunes into what we do. I'm not a fool. Neither is Drew. I know that AEW is going to do what they need to do and what they want to do. At the end of the day, we're just two fucking podcasters. And we talk about pro wrestling weekly on Tuesday. I don't know what the feeling is there. AEW has great pro wrestling. They do. That's not even an if and or a but. They got the best pro wrestling on the planet. You, you, you would be a fool to think that they don't have a better in-ring product than the WWE. What they don't have is leadership. What they don't have is the one thing that I've been asking for for months now. Why are the ratings in the toilet? And I don't want to make things about the ratings, but when you look at that show on Wednesday, not having any real emotion, down below 800,000, and a demo that did a 0 0.23, which, the, which was the lowest in four years. Yet you got Osprey, Mercedes, Okada, and all these big signings that you're gloating about. What's the problem? AEW put on the best television in years for the entire month of March this year. What's the problem? They don't have an overlapping storyline that is going to take them to the next level. People want to watch weekly episodic television. People want to watch a story that is developing over weeks of television that is going to keep you watching for more. I want to sit there at the end of the show and have a feeling of, I can't wait till fucking next week's show to find out who this is or find out where this is going or blah, blah, blah. They did that. They tried that with the devil, and that fell right. flat on its face. Uh, and I, yeah, at some point, Drew and I, a lot of people were hanging on to everything. Who's who the masked men? Who's underneath the mask? Who's who's targeting MJF? Where was it going? They had that. And then they dropped the fucking ball. It was captivating. But, yeah, but I will the the ratings thing is 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 dated. It's not nice. It is dated, but you can't sit there and tell me that it's not an aspect that people look at. It but it, it's 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 a ridiculous like win and loss you know, flag bearing thing for the tribalist community that AEW and WWE has. It's ridiculous because pro wrestling's never been hotter right now. I mean, it, ha you know, it was in the nineties and the eighties and stuff like that, but this is kind of the Renaissance. It's another boom era. And realistically, like if you go look at some of the things from 2019 to 2014, if you go look at ratings, both AEW dynamite and WWE, they're down like half a million to 600,000 viewers like both of them are it's cable is is an is an old way without using sat words an old way of looking at what's being viewed as success the attendance for aew is a glaring problem when they go to some of these venues 
That is something that should not be ignored. But WWE has had like what 16 consecutive sellouts or selling out WrestleMania two nights in a row in a stadium. But their viewership is down compared to 2019 because it's 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 old news. The ratings are old news. If you could still pull, you know, 750,000 to 1.5 million to 2 million uh, a week, you're crushing it. Because realistically, the ratings are it's, it's stupid. It, it pro wrestling is hotter than it's ever been in the past two decades. And people are looking at ratings and being like one win for the good guys. And it's like, no, no, that's not what this is about. It's not 98. Move on. Move I know. On. I know. I know there are other metrics, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, everything comes into account. Twitter X. I know everything comes into account. And the we'll w- touch on that, the WWE, you know, I don't want to compare companies because one is, Label the alternative, and then you got what WWE is doing. But WWE, I'm using as a prime example here because a lot of people tell me these fucking accounts on social media, they are so blinded because they want to flag bear AEW and wave the flag for AEW so much that they're blinded by what the fucking problems are. And I'm going to mention what WWE's done right. I want you to look at what The Rock is doing with Cody. Weekly episodic television. After that ending last week, it made you want to see what is happening next. Even something like CM Punk and Drew McIntyre, they are planting seeds for a match that's not even happening until August, potentially. But they got you interested. They got you hooked. Look at what they're doing. They're weak. They're weak. They're, They're building towards something that's driving you to watch week by week. The fucking geeks online that tell me constantly, oh, the story is in the match. And AEW tells stories within the match, which leads to something. Let me tell you something. A story that happens in the match is for the match specifically. How the fuck did we get to the match? That's the problem. I don't understand the problem that these people have without really looking at what's going on here. It's right in front of your eyes. That's not the fucking thing that AEW should be doing. Or here's a better one. They create an angle out of fucking thin air and then make it into a storyline. Folks, let me tell you something. That's not a story. That's an angle. A story and an angle is a different fucking thing. That's not telling weekly episodic stories. They need something like the Bloodline story that carried SmackDown for the entire year two years ago with Sami Zayn and his inclusion till Sami Zayn was be- uh, betrayed Roman. That's what they need. They don't need fucking weekly great matches. We know we get that. Give me a fucking yeah. break with this shit. Yeah, again, and for the people in the comments, very well said, J.D., uh, and especially on the angle and storyline thing, there's two completely different things. For the, for the people in the in the comments being like, WWE versus WCW was all about ratings. Yeah, that was 98, man. Yeah, the we ratings consu- were se- fucking 7, 8, 9 million people right, a week. But, but again, we're cons- we were consuming content differently, and we consume content now differently. That's just how it is. You want to go see if someone's a, a big draw? Go look at their YouTube views. AEW, Copeland and Christian outdrew Mercedes in less than six days. She's been in AEW. Her debut only had a million views. I say only. It's a good, it, it's a it's a great testament. But Copeland and Christian's match from Dynamite was at 1.2 million five days afterwards. Mercedes just toppled a million 14 days after her debut. I'm not saying Mercedes isn't a draw, but you want to see numbers? You want to see real numbers. Go look at YouTube views. Go look at impressions. Go look at different metrics than just ratings. Go look at ticket sales. Why is WWE so hot right now? Because you got people sitting at home being like, I need to be in that building. I want to feel that energy. That is the difference. And AEW, look at Revolution with Sting. How many people wanted to be in Greensboro just to feel and be a part of that crowd and that match? That is what professional wrestling and sports entertainment is all about. And that's what sells tickets. The want and desire to not miss out. The fear of missing out. The want and the desire to feel that energy and be a part of something special. It grips you. That is what it's all about. That's why you go to movies. That's why you go to games. That's why you go to sporting events. That's why you go to concerts. If there's nothing for people to sink their teeth into, they're not going to come. And that is is why the attendance at times for AEW is down because people can't get invested in shit. You don't give them time to be invested in. What is there to what is there to invest in? 
A great wrestling match? What's the fucking story? Ooh. What what are, what are, what are you doing there to bring me out to watch the show weekly to see great wrestling? AEW can I said this how many fucking times on this show people? AEW could fucking shit out great matches. Legitimately, they are a five-star match machine. It's a factory does that great work? matches. No. It doesn't work here. J New Japan Pro Wrestling is huge in Japan because realistically, it's a different type of fan base. They are there for the sport of professional wrestling and the art of wrestling. They're quiet. They sit there and they digest everything. It doesn't work here in the States. That's why New Japan isn't selling out Madison Square Garden every other month or doing stadium shows here in the States because, first of all, they're not readily available. And second of all, that style doesn't work here. It doesn't. You know, I don't want to sit here and blast Tony Khan because Tony Khan has done a lot of good. He has. But then you get people sh coming out on social media. Thank you, AEW. AEW saved my life. Or AEW, you know, they gave me everything that I that I could possibly ask for in this life. You had the whole fucking Freakazoid Brigade out. Some of the roster came out thanking AEW after the CM Punk podcast with Ariel Hawani. No shit. We understand that. And we're not refuting that. But if you are going to continue to cover up the problems, I will continue to expose them, and Drew will continue to expose them any chance we're given a live microphone. It is not the way it needs to be. And CM Punk's words hurt everybody so badly because they were 100% factual. I don't want to sit here and say Tony Khan is a money mark, but Tony Khan is exactly what I said Vince McMahon was when Vince McMahon was running WWE when he was there before, before all the allegations. Nothing more than a fucking toy box with a different toy every week, and he gloats to the fucking kid at school. Look at all the shiny new toys I got. Look at what I have and what you don't. That's great, bro. What are you doing to sell me on watching the fucking show weekly? You did a great job in March. What's next? What's going into Dynasty? What's going into June, July, August? W what are you doing then? I don't want to sit here and blast him because I have no fucking idea what he's got up his sleeve, and he may prove us all wrong, but... The problem exists because there is no long-term story. None. None. Well, I, don't, I don't agree with the uh, shiny toy reference. I think Tony is a fan at heart, and it's and, well, I know he's a fan at heart, and it's like when an owner buys a professional sports team that they've been a fan of their whole life. Like if I was given the opportunity to buy the New York Jets, just like Gary V wants to buy the New York Jets. There's a different type of connection you have with the product, with the team, with the entity. And I believe Tony Khan truly cares about a demographic that normally is swept under the rug and not given a shit about. Onk basically said it on Ariel Hawani on the MMA Hour. He said that internet niche audience is very small and there's a global audience that we want to cater to and should cater to. Punk told you everything you needed to know. I don't believe Tony Khan is the 11-year-old kid that is buying wrestling figures in real life. Now, I know the comparison is easy to, to draw, but I don't believe that. I believe that Tony truly cares about what the perception is and what he sees on social media because Tony was one of those kids who was in the chat rooms. He was playing uh, PW, what was it? Um, I can't remember the game where you're basically like playing a wrestling simulator. He was one of those guys and, and a kid. And now he's getting the chance to live out his dream because of the opportunities he's worked for and he's been afforded. And I don't believe that Tony is just buying up talent to play with his wrestlers. I think Tony truly cares about a demographic and an audience that normally isn't cared about. And that's why the 800,000 stays the 800,000. If you want to talk about ratings, because Tony really loves that audience because he believes that that's his audience and he's right, but he needs to take different and AW needs to take different steps into appealing to a mass demographic. So what are you, what are you basically saying? Tony Khan is like an overweight individual who doesn't want to go to the gym and be better. Is that what he's content with being fat? No, 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 no. I think that Tony cares so much about people like what me and you think to a certain extent and others on social media because he was once that fan that wanted to see certain things happen and never got it because it wasn't cool or it wasn't appealing to the mass demographic and it wasn't something that was ever going to happen. Like if you go back and watch, WWE was never going to put the championships on guys like Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. 
they did it because they were going through a steroid scandal and Vince McMahon wanted to change the perception of what WWE looked like. That's why those guys got the opportunity. And I think Tony sits back and realizes that just like me, that was some of my favorite wrestlers of all time. And realistically, I'm not going to sit back and cater my entire show to a mass demographic. I'm going to cater it to the people that I resonate with that make me feel warm and fuzzy. And that's the IWC and some other people in the wrestling community that are on X or on different social media platforms. And is it a detriment at times? Yeah, because he does need to appeal to a mass demographic. But I feel like Tony is more comfortable appealing to that demographic than any other, which is the small niche social media IWC demographic. And again, I applaud him because not the other company is definitely not going to do that. They give you bits and pieces. Like if you go look at WrestleMania cards, right? You get your attractions and then you get your, holy shit, this is going to be a good wrestling match. This is going to be a good wrestling match. The way, the way, that, the way that I'm interpreting what you're saying, I am, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying, but I think mm -hmm. the way that I'm interpreting it is that Tony Khan is sticking to his guns. He's sticking to his laurels. He's sticking to what his heart believes. And that will ultimately kill him in the end because he refuses to change the company, the way that the company needs to be run. That's the way I yeah. see it. And again, I think Tony is looking at it from a fan's perspective because he is a fan and he will always be a fan. And he is doing things that maybe he's wanted to see in the wrestling business instead of appealing to what a, a room full of board members want him to do. They're not publicly traded, but you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. I think Tony has always wanted to do this and he's living out his dream, but now we need to do things a little bit differently so that we can look at this company as a profitable entity. And I think we're, we're getting close. I think we're getting more stories in AEW, but I don't agree with the whole shiny new toys that he's buying and he gets to sit and play wrestling. Like my son does up in his room. I just, I don't see it. So I, I want to make this uh, clear before we move on to the next segment here uh, about what pay um, punk said about uh, the rest of this interview with Hawani. Uh, Tony Khan is making some changes. I, I want to make that abundantly clear. He is bringing in creative writers. He brought in Jennifer Pepperman. How much that's going to affect the direction of AEW creatively, that remains to be seen. We're not going to get a gist of that over three weeks. Uh, he is making uh, changes. He brought in a new uh, COO. So, I mean, they're making changes where it needs to be, you know, where, where changes need to be made. So he is making those strides. I don't want to sit here and tell you he's not, but... I think more needs to be done. Seriously. So the conversation jumps back to Page, Adam Page, that is. Workers' rights. Punk says that he thought his run was great up until that point. Punk wasn't upset by what Page said, but that it wasn't what they agreed upon in a meeting ahead of time, so it led to bad television and left him wondering if the planned physicality at the end of the segment would be an issue too. So basically they had discussed what they were going to say, and Page legitimately uh, went off the rails and did something that Punk and he did not talk about. So I wonder why that wasn't reprimanded, why Paige wasn't reprimanded by Tony Khan there, why Tony Khan doesn't have a fucking earful about what's being said out there, leaving these guys to go out there and say what they say, gave the opportunity for that situation to happen. I don't get it. I, I look at that and I'm like, I don't know how we even got here. Afterwards, he confronted Paige about why he went off the plan and he thought I got his friend fired who wasn't fired. Punk went to Tony and the lawyer and told them to fix it because they wouldn't like what he would do if he had to, which I guess we saw because he stewed it home until he was uh, healed from the broken foot. And the first thing that he did was fucking address Adam Page. Three months at home, he's like, I can't wait to get back and fucking blast this guy on live television. Everything went off the rails from there, and it's a shame, he says. Punk says his remarks at the all-out or, or all scrum weren't planned, but when he saw reporters there who are friends with other wrestlers and who wrote things about him without checking with him, it set him off. He does say it's in his top three CM Punk promos, though. Mindy's. There was nothing in the scrum that Tony Khan hadn't heard before. Punk doesn't think he can talk about what happened afterwards, which we alluded to earlier. Confirms he's referring to Brawl Out and says he didn't have to sign an NDA for anything I did wrong. He has nothing he wanted to hide. But Khan wanted him to sign an NDA. He doesn't know why. Punk thought he was done with the company after that, calling back to saying he wanted his release rather than going with the dynamite collision split plan. No one wanted to talk to him for six months after that, or no one did talk to him for six months. 
He researched, booked, and paid for his own triceps recovery surgery and says the differences between how AEW and WWE handles things like this is night and day. That took me by surprise, Drew. What would you think of that when he... Uh, Doc Samson reached out to CM Punk. Okay. I can tell you that right now. So, he was the only I, one, though. Right. But I'm just saying, like, we, I'm not going to... I'm not going to sit here and, and bash their medical staff because I know for a fact that, you know, and, you know, CM Punk said it, but I know that Doc was in, and I think he did say it, right? Didn't Punk he say did, it? He, made, he did mention yeah. Doc, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, listen, is that is that bullshit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, should there be people who are handling that for Phil Brooks, especially one of your biggest and brightest uh, talents? Yes, you should 100% have that. So um, that's, you know, a little ridiculous. But again, uh, CM Punk seems to be Phil Brooks seems to be just like of my mindset. Oh, you're you're not reaching out, you're not calling me. I'll handle it myself, and I will never forget it. And that's what he did. That's what he did. But again, you know, um, there are so many things that AEW needs to change, and we cannot be blind to them. This is obviously one of them. They need to be better with ticket sales. They need better pricing scales. They need to continue to move merchandise and smaller they need to venues. Well, if For if now. they can make if they can make it work with the internet and you guys remember, they got to run television from these venues. So they got to have that type of that accessibility for them. You know, they're, they're broadcasting, you know, nationwide. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, even in, you know, more than just nationwide. So, you know, again, there's a lot of things they need to change. The structure is obviously one of them. And I think they're making changes here and there that could benefit the company, but yeah, this, the non-reaching out, especially when your biggest star, one of your biggest stars is hurt, is a miss. Yeah, he did say that he's uh, actually ahead of schedule with his tricep injury now in WWE than he was in AEW. And I do have a question, a side note, Drew. I got, I got to ask because I was sure. thinking about this during this whole interview. Uh, you know, AEW, we sit here and we say, what could be done better? How do we fix this? How do we fix that? Why did they do away with the house shows? Because typically, the house shows is like an appetizer. Hey, I like this promotion. I never seen these guys before. I never seen her or him wrestle. Let's go out, take the family out to a house show and get the show on the road to build some equity and build the brand up so that when they come back to that city, people are more apt to go see a dynamite or a collision. Why did they do away with the house shows? Uh, well, first of all, you know, realistically, WWE has changed their business model too in terms of house shows. Um, it's a lot on the talent. There's a lot more injuries, um, but you also get reps, and I think that's what these are for. Also, you could hit some different markets that you maybe normally don't bring television to. And you're right. You could do things at house shows. Maybe a family gets out, all that other stuff. But I think what AEW should do and why they went away with it, I think, is a cost-effective measurement um, in a company that is signing talent to a you know heft, a lot of, con uh, of talent to hefty contracts. And they have other things going on. And their roster is, is pretty bloated. I think it's a cost measurement thing. Also, I think... You know, the lore of AEW is you only have to work Wednesday or Saturday, you know, yeah. plus pay-per-views. When you start getting into like a WWE S schedule, it's it's like, okay, well, do I want to work there or do I want to work here? You know, you get some artistic freedom in AEW way more than you probably would in WWE, but I think that's part of it. The other thing, if it's me and Tony asked me, Drew, what would you do? I would run Daly's Place every month, Saturday and Sunday for house shows. That's what I would do. Or maybe something like that. Like I'd run, you know, Daly's place on a Saturday and Sunday, and then maybe I'd go to, I don't know, Tampa or something or whatever. I would run them for sure. But again, um, it's got to be, the timing's got to be right. And you got to feel like you could draw. And you don't want, you know, a thousand people showing up to your house show because then it's it's a net negative. Yeah. As to why he did a great to come back, he says, I have a lot of friends in AW and Khan wasn't going to let him go. Rather than sit at home, he thought he tried to get some guys together and have some fun shows, which was the case because Collision in that first month has never been better. And they haven't really reached that height since the first month of the show. Those shows were fucking great. They were better than Dynamite. So that's exactly what he did. He knew as soon as he came back, it wasn't going to work. X, if there was anything that he's proud of from his time in AEW, he says he's got a lot of friends over there. They got to do a lot of cool shit, specifically mentioned getting to work with Sting. I think the positives outweigh the negatives. So he didn't have to say that, but he did say the positives outweigh the negatives. I look at it more like I was, or I thought I was. I thought I was coming in to help, to help the business. If I could teach something great, and I think I was just brought in for other reasons, you know, their business. I know a lot of people are going to be upset. Uh, it's just not predicated it's not a real business. It's not about selling tickets. We did talk about that. He talks about attending an indie show recently. 
and telling someone that what happens there works at that level, as evidenced by selling out an arcade bar. But that shit doesn't fly on national television. I think that's being proven right now. So basically, he's saying that AEW still has that indie mentality, which they need to break very, very quickly. I legitimately wish everyone there well. I'm just recounting my past. He says he's proud of the work he did with MJF. It's probably AEW's greatest feud ever, uh, with some of their best matches ever. And thinks MJF's future is bright, and he's immensely talented. He wasn't great when he catered to the niche internet audience. What'd you think of that comment about MJF catering to the internet audience? Uh, I think it's accurate, and I think MJF moved away from it. I, you know, and I think that's smart. Um, they have a ton of talent. They being AEW has a ton of talent that already has um, that. You know, uh, all the eyeballs of the niche audience on them. So while. While MJF was smart to try and gain some respect from that audience, which he did in his Iron Man match and some other things, the bull rope match with Punk and all, it was a bull rope match, right? Uh, with uh, who? Uh, MJF? Yeah. It was a uh, dog collar match. Dog collar match. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, and he gained a lot of respect from that audience, the IWC audience and all that other stuff. Uh, MJF is the total package. And I'm not talking about Lex Luger. Like he's got it all. Yeah. So. It was smart for him to gain that equity, um, and now you know I think you're seeing what CM Punk was talking about with MJF, which is he's becoming slowly but surely AW's main attraction, and not just this guy who can have great matches weekly. Yeah. Uh, X, if AW will be around, Punk's Punk thinks it's a load of questions. Says it's always going to exist as long as Tony Khan wants to pump money into it. Whether they can be successful is a matter of perspective. There's nothing wrong with being stuck in the indie mindset. If you're still happy that some goof gave you a five-star match and the building's a quarter full, listen, we're not in the same business, he tells Ariel. I was sold on AEW being very much an alternative to what WWE was, and that's the biggest shame to me. This is the last chance. Then he says this, which a lot of people kind of ran with and made into a big deal. I didn't really see the big deal with this because I saw exactly where Punk was coming from. He said, guaranteed money almost kind of ruined pro wrestling. If you had to get paid off the house, things would drastically be different. He ain't wrong. He is not wrong. And what I took from that comment is that Tony signs these guys, these men and women, to guaranteed money. They wrestle maybe once or twice a week, if that. Have to show up for work once or twice a week. There's no house show circuit, pay-per-view minus a pay-per-view. What that does, in my, in my mindset, the way I interpret that was... You know, you're getting paid all this money. Whether you work or not, you're getting the same amount of money, and people are going to get lazy because they know they're going to get paid no matter what. That's what Punk is saying. There's no drive. There's no drive. Yeah. If if there was a cap on what everybody was making in AEW and you had to go out and be paid based off how many people were sitting in that arena and how much merch was being sold and pay-per-view numbers, happen. you know, obviously it's not going to happen. But if you had to pay, get paid on all those other aspects, how much harder would you work to attain what you want to make yearly in AEW as opposed to, hey, man, I'm yep. going to sit around fucking six days out of seven and not do shit, and Tony's going to pay me the same amount whether I'm there or not. That's what yeah. he's talking about. I I think it's very – it's prominent in my industry, um, and that's, you know, how we hire a lot of people, and that's how I was brought on was here's, you know, 75000 here's 80000 and quarterly bonuses depending on performance. And I think that – you know, while that would be great for the wrestling business, it'll never happen because then basically, you know, the unionization of the wrestling business, which is something that everyone's wanted for years, decades, you know, centuries almost, um, will never happen because that comes with equal pay and a collective bargaining agreement and all that other stuff. And you will get to see what everyone's making. And if XYZ is making $5 million, well, I want to make $5 million too. And then you have equal pay across the board it'll never work it'll the unionization of professional wrestling will never happen it will never happen be solely because of that instance right there and to jd's point uh performance-based metrics should be the reason you get paid either higher or lower and i said this yesterday i'm not a journalist i am not a reporter i'm a businessman and cm punk is very good for business go look at the numbers folks yes he is I mean, just look at what he did on Monday Night Raw. I don't want to use the ratings as a metric because we just talked about how the ratings is an outdated aspect. But Punk, last week with McIntyre, did 
500,000 more than any other segment on Monday Night Raw uh, last week with Drew and Seth Rollins. They weren't there for McIntyre, even though he's been fucking unbelievable. They weren't there for Rollins. They were there for Punk. So yeah. is he a draw? <laughs> yes, he's a fucking draw. Yeah. And somebody asked, why is this guy talking like we don't know wrestling terms? That's not what I said. I don't like to use them because me and JD are not in the wrestling business. We're not wrestling in the middle of the ring right now. No. We're not doing an angle or a storyline for a major professional wrestling company. So it's called just talking like normal human beings, not professional wrestlers. Two more things here left bullet points from the podcast. He said he had two contracts. Drew alluded to that earlier. One as a talent and one as a, as a consultant to Tony Khan. I think we all kind of figure that out uh, over time. He thinks Tony wishes he was still there, which is definitely the case. But others are probably glad he's gone. Won't say who, but it's people who didn't want him there in the first place. And then he goes on to say that he doesn't ever think he'll bury the hatchet with Colt Cabana. He says Cabana approached him at some point before All Out 2022 and that incident, but he told him he wouldn't speak to him without a lawyer present. And that was basically the gist of the AEW discussion with CM Punk and Ari Hawani, which I thought was a fantastic two-hour podcast on his MMA hour. I thought it was very well done. Yeah, I thought it was very well done, too. And again, I thought he was open and honest. Uh, I thought Punk continues to show why he's one of the best uh, interviewees in the game. And if you can get him to be open, free, and honest and have a cup of coffee with him, I, it's well worth it. And it was another you know, uh, notch for Ariel Hawani. I want to get into the AEW releases here. This actually happened uh, at the 10 o'clock hour while we were getting into the third hour of Monday Night Raw. I've just seen a lot of people tweeting about AEW releasing uh, several talents. This is coming from Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful.com. The following names have been released from the company. And Tony Khan is making budget cuts. And like Drew and I talked off air before we actually went live here with TNT, uh, everything is a coincidence. You know, it's not, or what'd you say? It was not, uh, this is not a coincidence or something along those lines. Yeah, nothing in, nothing in life is a coincidence. Do I believe that this was something that was probably planned and then all of a sudden Tony was like, okay, let's let's do this now. Yeah, probably. I'm Listen, if I'm, if I'm betting, here's the deal, which also I heard Seth Rollins use on Monday Night Raw. Um, and The Rock did too. Not that I... Or we coined that. Phrase, and when are we going to get a shout out on a weekly show that they watch TNT? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a TNT guy. Listen, I doubt Dwayne's watching, but DJ, <laughs> if you're watching, what's up? Um. Anyways, I, you know, I believe that Tony was watching the CM Punk interview, just like the rest of the yes. world was. So, so these names have been released. Stu Grayson, which he was a part of the Dark Order tag team of Evil Uno. I mean, they didn't really do much of him after that uh, initial time that they brought him back for a second time. Dasha Fuentes was released, ring announcer. I thought she did a, a decent job. I didn't think she was uh, Justin Roberts, but they let her go. No reason why. Uh, Anthony Henry, which a lot of people were upset about. He was a tag team with J.D. Drake in the Work Horseman. Dalton Castle's boys were released. So uh, Dalton Castle is going to need uh, maybe a new gimmick or some new boys. Slim J was released. Gravity. Jose, the assistant, was released. He was with uh, LFI, which is a little uh, a little weird. Parker Boudreaux was released after he had stated that he's still with AEW prior in the day, and then he deleted his tweet uh, after they released him. And Jorah Joel, no idea who that is, but those are the names right now released. Uh, more names are to be expected, they say, but uh, they'll update the list as soon as possible. You know, Tony Khan didn't release these people because of what CM Punk said about AEW not being run as a business. He, that that did not lead him to release these people. Obviously, this was a calculated, you know, thought out process, and they're looking to cut payroll. They just brought in three huge contracts, so I'm assuming that AEW is going to try and cut budget where it's necessary. They may limit the amount of people that they do bring in from this point on. I know the machine guns are rumored to be going to AEW. I don't know how likely that is. I think we should be done with bringing people into AEW. But I will say this, Drew, and I don't want to come off as insensitive, but I do think that we could maybe get another 10 to 20 releases from AEW. I do think they need to trim the fat even more so. I don't want people to lose their jobs, but Tony Khan has brought in so many people that aren't being yeah. used that I think a budget cut for AEW, even though he said he didn't want to do it, is necessary for the company. Yeah, I would sit back, and I don't have it in front of me, but you know, if I was given the 
uh, financials for AEW and who's making what and who's maximizing TV time that we give them. Are we giving said person enough TV time? Should we, et cetera, et cetera, cost effective measurements. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people that I would probably cross off, but again, these are guys and girls who are trying to make a living. So I'm not going to sit here and throw speculative, um, content out there for you on who I believe is going to be released or who I think should be released. I would do that privately. Um, and again, I think there's to JD's point, there's a lot of fat to be trimmed and we'll see what happens, but you know, signing Okada, Will Ospreay and Mercedes is going to have a ripple effect because those are three fat contracts and de deservingly so. So now what happens just like in any business that isn't run like a, a clown show is you have to trim, uh, some of that fat and it probably comes in, you know, you sign three, you got to release 26, 27. It's just what happens, unfortunately. Uh, moving on, we got some WWE news and notes here. Uh, the WWE is heading to Glasgow for mm -hmm. the Clash of the Castle in Scotland this June, Saturday, June 15th, which is very telling because uh, a Scotland native is a free agent, supposedly, uh, after WrestleMania. So a lot of people are now speculating what the deal is with Drew McIntyre going into his WrestleMania match against Seth Rollins on night two this coming weekend. What do you make of this, Drew, that they announced this? I'm glad that the, the concept is back. I thought the first one was fucking incredible. I think those fans over there are going to be rabid as, as hell. I love the yeah. UK fans or, or the European fans. And then, obviously, Drew McIntyre is going to have a huge play in this. And, and the one thing that he has wanted, as far as a WWE contract extension, is he wants more time with his family. I, again, like you said, I don't find this to be a coincidence. No, I think that Drew McIntyre is is either going to win the world championship um, at this PLE, or he'll be walking in as you know champion. I yeah. I would like to, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they give Drew that moment, maybe in in uh, in Philly, in Scotland. Oh. No, I think they might give it to him in Scotland. I if they give it to him in Philly and Priest doesn't cash in and all that other stuff, I could easily see. CM Punk and Drew McIntyre main eventing that PLE because it holds about 15,000 people. So I could see it. So you, you think Punk is going to be back by that time, huh? Yeah. Oh, well. Okay. Yeah, they got like, what, three months, two yeah. months before that show? Yeah, I think he'll be back. So that's uh, that's pretty exciting. So uh, also uh, another side note here. I know AEW has not announced the June date for Forbidden Door. Clearly it won't be that weekend. So it's either going to be before that or what I think is going to be after that. Whatever the, the Saturday or Sunday is following the June 15 date is when we'll see Forbidden Door uh, here at the Arthur Ashe Stadium in Queens. So Yes, sir. Uh, moving on with uh, some other news and notes here. We have, uh, what do I got here? Bo Dallas. Did you watch the documentary yet? Of course. I have not. So uh, I will uh, not talk about the documentary, but I do know what happened at the end of the documentary because people leaked mm -hmm. the fucking ending of it online. Bo Dallas. Not really. It's not really the ending. Okay. Well, it was a huge, uh, I guess, pertinent to He's TV correct. moment. Yeah. Yeah. Bo Dallas update. Bo Dallas could be returning to WWE TV. At least it's being hinted at via the Bray Wyatt, uh, Bray Wyatt documentary that was re revealed on Monday. At the end of the newly released Bray Wyatt documentary, there is a familiar imagery in the signature ominous Bray Wyatt style. There is a video that is likely hinting towards the future of Bo Dallas. There's a lantern that pans out. Before hearing a voice say, run. Then we see the silhouette of a figure which looks to be Uncle Howdy. Uh, and good news on this. WWE sources have told Fightful it's a teaser for Bo Dallas's eventual return. We don't know when that will be, but it was a deliberate inclusion. We also haven't learned what a return could look like as of yet. One WWE rep noted to Fightful months ago that they did not want to rush Dallas back after the untimely passing of Brother Bray Wyatt. I'm all for it, bro. I said, you know, if they want to bring back Bo, which I think would be great to have him live on with the legacy of Bray Wyatt, uh, I think it would be great. Clearly, it wasn't going to happen so soon after Bray's passing. And even like you said, and I said last week, I think the Hall of Fame induction would have been too soon. They want to let that kind of breathe a little bit. Same thing with this. I'm all for it, man. If they want to have the memory of Bray live on through his brother, man. If they do it right and they do it in an epic way, I'm all for it. Yeah, I think it's got to be Uncle Howdy. Yeah. Um, because that was Bo, obviously, and I, I, I just, I don't want to see, um, 
Like, I don't want to see Bo resurrect, you know, the Fiend and the Firefly Funhouse and stuff like that. Like, Bo should kind of do his own thing. He could definitely carry the lantern and be Uncle Howdy. It could kind of be that character. But, again, that's just me. You know, I, I love what's what's uh, potentially going to happen with Bo Dallas and the memory of Wyndham Rotunda. The documentary was fantastic. It really puts life in perspective. It really shows you the genius of Wyndham. Um, and I will say that, you know, yesterday while watching that, while I was working, um, it made you just really, it's always been huge in my life, but family is so important. And Bray exemplified that. Wyndham exemplified that. And, you know, his art, he was a madman, but most madmen are geniuses. And that's what, that's what Wyndham was and will always be. Again, I put out on social media, I think it would be cool if we got Taker comes out on a bike because I don't think he's going to do the dead man stuff anymore. Drives the lantern on his motorcycle down to the middle of the ring, puts the, the, the lantern in the middle of the ring. We get the fireflies. What a visual that would be. And Taker kind of saluting Bray one more time. And then, you know, we could be off to the races with Bo and whatever he wants to do. Yeah, I like it. Uh, I could actually see that happening on either Saturday or Sunday. Uh, we have one more piece of news here. WrestleMania news. Uh, there is a celebrity that WWE reached out to uh, for WrestleMania. Whether that will be Saturday or Sunday remains to be seen. Obviously, we got Meek Mill, Lil Wayne are going to be there as the musical performers. But while speaking with TMZ Sports last month, The Miz noted that he thinks retired Philadelphia Eagles center Jason Kelsey could be great in WWE. Now, Sean Ross Sapp of Fight for Select reported that WWE actually reached out to Kelsey for a possible appearance. It would be a good get for the company since he's a big star in the sports world and obviously in the city of Philadelphia. Do you see this being uh, the case for this weekend, uh, Drew? And not only Jason Kelsey, but more other sports, prominent sports figures in the Philadelphia market. Uh, absolutely with um, Jason Kelsey. And I will say this, my son's um, favorite celebrity involvement in professional wrestling, Bad Bunny, I think, is going to be a part of WrestleMania as well. Okay. Maybe uh, a part of that Rey Mysterio match? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. But I will tell you that I, I think WWE is going to get uh, Jason Kelsey and Bad Bunny involved in WrestleMania. And obviously, you know, I made the prediction of Steve Austin and John Cena. I think we're getting a whole boatload of surprises on Saturday and Sunday. Ilya Dragunov, he may be called up to the main roster. We know Carmelo Hayes is getting called up after WrestleMania and his match with Trick Williams at Stand and Deliver. Fightful Select is reporting that they've been told Dragunov is not planned for a call-up at this time, but is expected to make his way to the main roster when he loses the NXT championship. As some feel in NXT, he's beyond the brand at this stage of his career. Now, we don't know if he's going to drop the title to Tony D'Angelo on Saturday or not. Uh, I don't really know. I would not drop it to Tony D. I said last night when people brought up the discussion on my Raw post, I think Dijak would be the perfect opportunity to get that belt off of Dragunov. I think that would be an unbelievable match. Put it on Dijak. He's been putting in the work. He's great down there. And Dragunov could get called up around, I would say, some of these European shows that WWE's doing. Maybe Backlash. Maybe uh, Clash of the Castle. But I do feel Bash when Drag in Berlin. Bash in Berlin, I think that would be the perfect opportunity to do it. Maybe they uh, they hold it off till then. But whatever happens with Dragunov, I know a lot of people are clamoring for a Dragunov and Gunther match. I don't know if that's going to be the case right away. But whatever brand he goes to should be the same brand that Gunther is on. But uh, I will say this about Dragunov. Don't rush it. It's going to happen this year. Put the title on somebody that absolutely deserves it. Not saying Tony D doesn't deserve it, but I think Dijak is the guy. And anybody that's in the ring with Dragunov is going to be better off for it. He is absolutely phenomenal. One of my favorites in the entire company. And if you don't know who he is, start getting the Google machine ready. Get to know him. Because when you see him and you see him wrestle, you're going to want to see him more and more every time you do see him. So I can't wait for that to happen. Yeah. Um, I would love to see Ilya in... You know, raw on raw or smackdown um we'll have to wait and see i could easily see them you know bringing him up for bash in berlin uh, i like tony d to win the nxt you know world championship if you want to call it that and i think you know tony d and um 
what do they call it? Lexus King? Yeah. Uh, would be a good program. There's some others in NXT. I mean, Trick Williams. Yep. Um, I think Melo's gone. So, you know, we don't have to even talk about that. I think Melo's headed to the main roster, but there's a lot of talent in NXT. And um, yeah, I think Tony D and Lexus King and Trick Williams should be the, the top three to take that championship. And finally, guys, before we get into the super chats, I want to thank everybody for the uh, 30. 400 that we had in here on this Tuesday afternoon, man. Holy shit. Thank you guys very much. Um, I know oh, yeah, Paramore is playing. I believe Paramore will be playing Bailey to the ring. And Cody Rhodes might be getting a new version of Kingdom as well from uh, some teasers from Downstate. Um, one more thing. I know Drew and I had fun with it on Saturday. I was actually watching The Walking Dead, The, the Ones Who Live finale. Uh, with Rick and Michonne on Saturday, and I got that's still going on. No, it's over now. Six episodes, okay. it's over. Uh, I got a text. Like, yeah, the, the Walking the Dead series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. Spinoffs. All right. All right. So I got a text from my guy Big Hodge, and he sends me a whoa with a surprised emoji. I'm like, what the fuck happened now? He's like, Cardona is on AEW Collision. I'm like, get the fuck out of here, man. It was last Tuesday where Drew and I debated about what needs to happen with the Cope Open. Adam Culpin defending the TNT Championship in an open challenge. He gave his reasons why it's great. I gave my reasons why I didn't want to see another generic, you know, open challenge with the likes of Brian Keith and Lee Moriarty and these fucking nobot Tony Nice challenge. Like, nobody gives a shit. Do something different with it. I know Drew mentioned, like, John Cena did the U.S. Open Challenge so many years ago in WWE. I'm like, that's what you got to do. Bring somebody in who's not with the company that's going to be a genuine surprise. And then, lo and behold... I called Matt Cardona. If you want to make it special, let's bring somebody that's not with the company, like a Matt Cardona out. And who do we see? Matt Cardona show up on Saturday Night Collision. It was a great fucking match. He's not signed with the company. I don't think he's going to sign with the company, but that's exactly what you need to do. Now we got to one-up it. Now we got to get Ali in there. Now we got to get Nemeth, maybe a Matt Riddle. Who knows? Maybe Sheamus doesn't re-sign with the WWE, and maybe he shows up as a free agent in AEW. And challenges Adam Colton. What'd you think of the Cardona appearance, bro? I think the Cardona appearance was smart. I think when you're looking at an open challenge, you need to hit a home run out of the gate. You need to set a precedent. And they did. This means anybody, anytime, anywhere can show up from any different company, from any indie promotion to New Japan, to Ring of Honor, to whomever. Um, and I think, you know, when you start off with Matt Cardona, it'll be tough to go to, um, you know, uh, Lee Moriarty or somebody like you wanted to mention before. So I think they'll keep the name value up because that's the smart way to handle business. And as soon as, you know, we get some talent that's currently on the AW roster, then you start to have the alarm bells go off that, okay, maybe Copeland's dropping that championship sooner rather than later. My biggest problem with everything that happened, I love the Cardona thing. I love the match. It was a dream match that Matt wanted to have and that I'm sure Adam wanted to have as well. But Adam Copeland not defending the TNT Championship at Dynasty is a massive miss for me. It should yeah. just be Copeland versus Black. Yeah, I know. They they had Al uh, Alistair. Malachi Black come out. He'll be Alistair soon enough. Uh, Malachi Black show up and basically confront him and then Buddy Matthews attacked and then we get Briscoe... And Eddie Kingston saving the day, and we got this big six-man tag team match. Listen, I'm glad House of Black's getting a pay-per-view match because they, they're they great. But like you said, having that championship not defended on a pay-per-view, uh, I don't like that decision. But maybe maybe they'll, sa maybe they'll save it for double or nothing. I don't know. So hopefully that's you know, the case. I really, But I mean, at that point, it's like, I get it. Like, we don't need to have a TNT championship match on Dynasty because Copeland is defending it, you know, every week or every other week on Collision. And I get that, but man, I will tell you, I was excited for uh, Malachi Black and Adam Copeland. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, when it became a six man, I was like, man, this sucks. That sucks. I, I can understand that feeling. You know, let's get the Briscoe House of Black story finished. Obviously, he's backing up Copeland, and it gives way for them to tell a story between Copeland and Black. Maybe they build a program out of it, maybe they build some dialogue out of it. Why this happened, why that happened. So, you know, giving it some time to breathe, it might not be a bad thing. So we'll see what yeah. happens. But guys, I thank you for the 3,400 in here. Uh, I told Drew before uh, it was going to be a decent uh, audience tonight or this afternoon. 3,400. 3, uh, you guys eclipsed my prediction by three by 400. I said 3,000. Well, so thank you guys very much for all your support. 
We are going to get into your super chats, and then Drew's got some business to take care of. He's going to fly out to Philly, and then I'll be meeting him on Thursday, man. Very exciting week coming up. Follow us on social media, at JD from NY206, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Cameo, at Andrew Baydala on X. Go and follow us both for all the latest updates all week long in Philly. Yeah, can I Can I just, I want to yeah. pop in here real quick. Yeah. Guys and girls, if you see us in Philadelphia and you're like being timid about coming up and saying hi, I mean, if we're eating dinner, obviously, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe I, I always respect people's spaces, even if, you know, I know who they are or whatever, I'm not going to interrupt their dinner. But if you guys see us out and want to say what's up, come say what's up. Don't be weird. We're, we bleed just like you guys do. And, you know, we all are human and I would I have no problem saying hi or taking a picture. And I'm sure JD doesn't either with with people who you know love the show and whatnot. Don't be shy. If we're walking the streets or you see us at WrestleMania or whatever, come say hi. Yeah, like I said, we'll be at The Undertaker Show. We'll be at WWE World on Saturday. I'll be at House of Glory Friday or WrestleCon Saturday, WWE World on Friday. Where, wherever we are, just come and say what's up if you guys do see us out in public. But uh, make sure you guys hit that thumbs up. We got 1,000 likes. Appreciate you guys very much for that. Super Chats are open. Get them on in. And please hit that subscribe button down below and turn on the bell for all notifications. Cody with a $5 Super Chat. Cody Snyder kicked off Mania Week yesterday by watching Punk and Randy rewatch their Mania 27 match. Wholesome stuff, man. A couple of goats. I did watch it. And uh, the fact that Randy was very happy that Punk is back in WWE, man, brought a smile to my face. It really did. Uh, if I could give you a couple matches to go back and watch before WrestleMania happens on Saturday, go back and watch Brett and Steve from 13. Yep. Go back and watch the ladder match from WrestleMania 2000 with the Hardys, Dudleys, and Edge and Christian. Um, go back and watch. Let me give you one more. Go back and watch uh, Edge and Mick Foley from WrestleMania 22. One of fantastic. my favorites ever. Absolutely fantastic match. A Watson with a 22 months. What's up, JD? I got the Go Google It t-shirt weeks ago. I absolutely love it. Cheers, bro. Thank you, A Watson. Appreciate that, man. Captain Sala, $5 I'll see with Jeff Punk. Just gives dudes like Eric Bischoff and Jim Cornette hours and hours of material to work with. Let the podcast burials of Tony Khan begin. We don't want to bury Tony Khan. We love AEW. We want to see it succeed. We just want him to make the right business decisions as far as what is presented on TV. That's all we want. What those two guys do, I think they got some sort of agenda. Not my, uh, not my space to talk about it. MGM with a 1999. The Geeks hate when you give pushback and don't agree with every word JD says. It's the reason their shows shit on everyone else's. Not last in Cornette. You guys keep being great. And I'm going to laugh at Jesse when Ronda shows up. That's Drew's prediction. Ronda's going to show up in AEW. Wait, what happened? Did Jesse say no way? Uh, Jesse does not want to see Ronda show up in AEW. Oh, I mean. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, Michael Krause with the $2 Super Chat. JD and Drew Hopal as well on safe travels this week. Thank you, Michael. Lord J. Coyle with a five. Used to be a punk fan pre-AEW. These days, he seems like a bitter old man. Acts like he's for workers' rights, but says guaranteed money ruins wrestling. Well, Lord J., I explained to you why he said that. And hopefully that uh, depiction of what I said and uh, definition of what I said there made some sense to you. He is for the company. He loves pro wrestling. He just wants the best for everybody. Francis Luke, five dollars super chat. I saw a Super Bowl picture with Bailey, Naomi, Mercedes, and Britt Baker all together. Britt and Mercedes will eventually be in the ring together. Yeah, they need to get Mercedes in the ring ASAP. Soon. Michelle with a two. Some days I feel like TK runs AEW like a toy box. Well, Drew didn't agree with that. I said that he didn't agree with it, but that's why the show's the best. You have your opinion, I have yeah. mine. Francis Lou with a five. I can just sit here or and hear the fans chanting CEO, CEO. That will be a pay-per-view match, though, uh, with DMD, maybe for the T and or the TBS title. I could see Mercedes winning the TBS title for sure. I think that's gonna happen. I think Willow's gonna win it, and then she's gonna battle uh, Mercedes for the title. Raging Girl Gamer with a new membership. I know that's not the case. She's a member for 42 months. I don't know why it says a new membership. Sorry, this may be a stupid question, but are you and Andrew going to be at WrestleMania doing meet and greet at the tailgate? Yes, we are, Rach. Yes, we are. If you're there, come say what's up. Chef Joss with the pot, 199. My boys, what lot will the tailgate be located? Um, we're going to get that information shortly, but I can tell you that we have a parking lot. Couple, We have like three or four spaces right next to 
Lincoln Financial Field. Like, we're in the Lincoln Financial Field parking lot. Okay. Scott Woodford with 13 months. Happy Tuesday. Wrestling Soup MF. Keep up the great work, J.D. Scott. Thank you, brother. Love the, the guys over at Wrestling Soup. Good bunch of guys. Dylan Cummings with a fire all super chat. Punk said TK is a nice guy, but also said he's a clown. How do you think he personally feels about TK? I think I think he he basically told you he thinks TK is a nice guy, but he's not running the business like Punk would want someone to run a business. Average gamer with a seventeen ninety nine. It's funny to see how people online blame CM Punk, but no one batted an eye over Jack Nobody Perry cussing at management. I love AEW, but fuck its fans. Yeah, man, they, uh, they're they very elitist, just like any other fan base. Dylan Cummings with the $2 Super Jet. Do you think Punk and the Elite will ever reconcile? No. No need. Uh, they're no off no doing their own thing. Part. No. Yep. Raging Girl Garen with the $5 Super Jet. Been a while since I donated. I'm sorry, JD. I got a new job and so happy. More donations coming soon. Your community seriously got me through a lot. Rage, happy to hear it, and we are happy that you are uh, in the midst of a new job. It's great to hear. Norbit. With a five. Looking forward to Mania. I will be there for night two. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Thank you, Norbert. Enjoy yourself. Sidro, 19 months. 19 months to the final bosses of the IWC. Enjoy WrestleMania. Wish I could be there. Have a Long Island for me. If you drink that or not, much love always. I love a good Long Island. Tay-Tay with a 499. Drew, I love being on your playback shows. JD, I love listening to your show. You guys are the best in the IWC. Keep it up. Thank you, Tay-Tay. Thank you, Tay-Tay. Sidro, five. Wondering what seats you and Drew got for Mania Night 1 and Night 2. Close to ringside. Hope you have a blast. P.S. Jack Perry, go touch some glass. Ha -ha. Uh, <laughs> guys, I'm not going to WrestleMania. Drew is. I'm not. I will be home covering the show on YouTube. There you go. Matthew Ruiz with a 100 bomb. Thank you, Matthew. The greatest tag team in all of entertainment, TNT. Please be safe. Take this donation and have a cold one on me this weekend. Matthew, we will certainly down a couple old fashions for you in Philadelphia. M. Scarada with a five. Elite and Tony fumbled. Ratings and attendance down since All Out 2023. It's obviously why. It's obvious why. Yeah, we talk about it all, uh, often, Scarada. Jamel turning with a 499. When Punk says slandering, he means Tony saying he feared for his life when he did nothing to him. Again, two sides to every story. AJ, 11 months. 11 months in the venue. For the best podcast in the IWC, JD and Drew respect. Can't wait for WrestleMania. Cody finally gets crowned champion. I can't wait. Yep. He will be champion Sunday night. Hush with a 499. Man, seeing the releases is heartbreaking. The issue of this is TK went out of his way to say he'd never do mass releases like WWE. What changed? The contracts of Okada, Mercedes, and Osprey. That's what changed. Yeah, absolutely. And if you guys want to see a WrestleMania prediction show with me and JD for night one, let us know. Yeah. If, if, if the demand's there, we'll do it. Phil with a 28 months. JD, Drew, great TNT as always. I'm looking forward to being there for my first WrestleMania. Can't wait to experience that atmosphere. Stay safe. Phil, enjoy yourself, brother. Too. Stay safe as well. Tay -tay. Come to the tailgate. Yeah. Tay Tay with a 999. CM Punk exposed AEW so badly that Tony Khan had to release 10 people yesterday. That wasn't the case, Tay Tay. That, that was uh, pre planned. Tony Khan needs to step up his leadership, book good television and storylines, and give us a reason to watch every week. Man of 1,005 holds, 31 months. One of my problems with TK is that he panics too often rather than go with the flow. Hope he becomes a better boss and the company grows. That's all we want. Deontay with a five. What do you guys think about CM Punk's comment that guaranteed money has ruined the business? We talked about that on the show, Deontay. Phil with a 999. Appreciate you, Phil. Uh, he says... Where the hell did he go? Oh, there he is. Bray Wyatt, Becoming Immortal, was amazing. It's a documentary that everyone, even non-wrestling fans, would enjoy. All he ever wanted was to leave a legacy for his family and fans, and he did. We miss Bray. He did. Like Drew said, a mastermind. Uh, you know, the crazier he was, the more genius he was. Yep. Vinny, 499. Moral of the punk story. Grass isn't always greener on the other side. Appy's back with WWE. Dude's a god on the mic. Yes, he is. And I can't wait for the Drew and uh, punk feud in WWE. Bradley with a 199. Are you going to the Wells Fargo Center Friday evening? I will not be. I'm doing House of Glory and going back to Atlantic City to cover SmackDown. I will be attending the Hall of Fame. 
Adam Casper with a $10 super chat. Happy Tuesday, JD and Drew. Looking forward to seeing how the rest of this week turns out. WrestleMania in the final four in men's and women's basketball goes. Uh, not into college sports, but uh, the final four, everybody loves that shit. Not me. Yep. It's baseball season. For some. Mike 43, for some. Mike 43, $2 super chat. Imagine CM Punk for dragon off. Weather is brutal, though. Yeah. Hopefully it gets better as we get closer to the weekend, Mike. I mean, come on. It's going to be 60 degrees and sunny on Sunday. I mean, I, listen, is it Miami? No. Is it you know, Texas? No, but I mean. Tootie weather. Put on Love a, it. Yeah, yeah, put on a hoodie and shut up. Hollywood guy with a five. J.D. Drew, will you be disappointed if Cody loses at WrestleMania? If he loses, what's next for him? He's not losing. Will I be disappointed? No. Furious Nation with a 999. What's up, J.D. and Drew? I know I haven't super chatted in a while, and I apologize for that. Been going through a lot with money issues, and I hope to see you guys this weekend. I'll be in Philly for WrestleMania. Nation, come on out, brother. Don't ever apologize for saving your money uh, due to financial hard times or hardships. We're all going through it. We appreciate your viewership. Absolutely. Ali with a 199. Hey, JD, would you see Stu Grayson in WWE or no? No. Micah does it with a 199. JD, can you vlog the tailgate for us who can't go? Uh, I'll see what I could do, man. I'm I'm very hesitant about vlogging in public. It's just a, a, a self-conscious thing, like, you know... Uh, confidence thing I, I don't like holding my camera looking at everybody look at me it's like something kind of weird to me yeah, about we, that um who is that that asked what's his uh, name micah micah um we might have somebody film and record the uh live tnt so that we might do um we'll have to figure out how to get that done but i have somebody who might be able to be a, a cameraman or a camera woman for us 40 by Dev. Rock has the best entrance right now in wrestling. Yes, it is uh, spectacular. And apparently I was uh, told that what they got planned for him at WrestleMania is going to be out of this world. Uh, Jeremy with 30 months. The best in the tag team IWC. Love TNT. Keep up the amazing work. Jeremy, thank you so much, brother. Nation again, 499. I also thoughts on Matt Hardy lately. Roxanne Perez is a heel and Motor City Machine Guns. Part of me would love to see the Machine Guns in WWE. And I'll be in Philly from 4-5 to 4-8. Love Roxanne. I think the machine guns land in AEW and Matt Hardy. I mean, I don't really care where he goes, honestly. Tone C with 13 months. I hope you guys enjoy Philly. Bring me back a cheesesteak. Thanks, Tone. Uh, we got Daniel Rodriguez, the 499. Drew, what are your thoughts? Should the Pats draft Marvin Harrison Jr. or grab a quarterback? Big toss up over here. Uh, well, I want the Jets to get Marvin Harrison Jr., so I'm going to hope the Patriots stay far, far away. But um, if I was a, the Pats GM, you take the best player available on the board, and if that happens to be Marvin Harrison Jr., fine. You never draft for need, in my opinion. You draft talent. And I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but I feel like the most successful people, GMs, coaches that are in the draft, draft the best talent available, not a, not a want or a need. Uh, Fiori's Nation with a 199. Also, Punk isn't wrong with what he said about AEW. I mean, some people think he's wrong. Some people don't think he's wrong. So it divided us even more so. Trey Lindsay with a new membership. Trey, thank you very much for the new membership. TK Banks with a five. Saw fan footage after all one of the year, and The Rock was whooping the refs with that belt. What a damn menace. Listen, man, Rock is killing it right now. No matter what might be a problem with the story, The Rock himself is fucking killing it. I love it. Adam Casper with a five. Maybe we see a Yankees Braves World Series in October. Guys, it's way too early. If the Braves and Philly are in the playoffs, man, I'm not giving the Braves any chance. It's not for the Mets. It's, it's over for the Mets. The John Wick of Spider Hunters. Nate, five dollars super chat. JD, I just want to say thank you for all you do. And hi, Drew, LOL. And Maki Ito versus Minoru Suzuki had a weird classic to start the week. Not for me, Nate. Not for me. I mean, WWE started off WrestleMania with Monday Night Raw, the Bray documentary, CM Punk on Ariel Hawani, and they just launched that next gen. WWE has really kicked off WrestleMania with yeah. the back. Yeah. And Jose Perez with a 199 TNT for life. That's all I got. See you at Mania. Jose, we will see you, and hopefully we'll see a lot of you at the tailgate and in and around Philadelphia. Thank you for a great episode 42, guys. Hopefully you got a lot out of the discussion. 
And we will see you back next week, man, with all the post-mania stuff. Mid, Mo, Smart with 31 months. Great breakdown of the Punk interview, guys. Great show as usual. Travel safe and enjoy the tailgate, mania, and festivities. Cheers. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Hopefully we'll see you in Philly. And we'll see you back here normal time Tuesday for episode 43 of Tuesday Night Titans. And we'll see you in Philly, guys. Thank you very much. And have a good night.